The myth of human-caused global warming will be discussed at the upcoming so-called conference in Copenhagen. Here with the truth on the issue of global warming is a real expert in the field, a genuine expert, Lord Moncton. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. Now tell the audience the real aim of the uh, conference in Copenhagen. The aim of the conference at Copenhagen is to try to persuade 192 nations who belong to a thing called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to sign a treaty which would create a new dictatorial, unelected world government with powers to impose a 2% tax on the gross domestic product of rich countries like the United States. That's broadly the, the equivalent of the uh, half the U.S. defense budget. It will also have the power to impose another 2% levy on every financial transaction. It will have the power to intervene directly over a, a Congress's head and over the president's head in the economy as well as the environment of the United States. It will have the power to confiscate all patent and intellectual property rights. It will have the power to control all free markets worldwide, so there'll be no such thing as a free market. It would, in effect, be an international communist dictatorship. I'm calling it that because that effectively is what these policies mean. All of these policies are in the draft treaty, and they have survived every round of the drafting so far. Not one Western country has so far spoken out on behalf of its people's freedom. Do you think we're going to go down the same road as Europe on global warming? Well, that, I think, is what is the aim of the Copenhagen Treaty. They've seen how easy it is to fool the nations of Europe, who once believed in freedom and democracy, into handing it over to a ghastly bureaucratic dictatorship. And as Václav Klaus, the president of the Czech Republic, was saying in Washington only the other day, the only difference between the EU and communism is that the EU isn't yet physically brutal, but in every other way it is essentially a communist regime, and that is what is being proposed now worldwide at Copenhagen. And I think that Obama, having been given his Nobel Peace Prize for precisely this purpose, will go there to take the keening plaudits of the row upon row of bureaucratic zombies who will be sitting there from all over the world. He'll want to take their applause, he'll want to do the grandstanding, and then he will sign anything. That's my view. He, he's not going to read the small print, and frankly, I don't think he particularly cares. His advisers were saying during the election campaign they hated the U.S. Constitution. They thought it was out of date and an obstacle to the advance of world left-wing causes. And I see no reason to suppose that he himself does not share the views of his advisers on this. I think they would like to see the back of the U.S. Constitution, and all he has to do to ensure that is to sign the Treaty of Copenhagen. How damaging to the U.S. could Copenhagen really be? The danger is this. During the election campaign, President Obama's advisers were openly talking of the Constitution as an obstacle to international progress, by which they effectively meant communist progress. And they said they were going to circumvent it if and as necessary, in particular in the making of treaties. There is a kind of backdoor procedure called the executive agreement process, by which the president could sign the treaty on his own authority, and then simply enact it into the law of the United States by a simple majority of both houses, which would remove the Senate's two-thirds majority, which is normally required under your Constitution, to ratify a treaty. And the danger then is that even if a subsequent administration wanted to cancel that, the fact that the president himself signed it might still be held by your Supreme Court, which is now itself very left-wing, uh, to be binding on the United States anyway, so that a subsequent administration would not be able to undo the treaty. That's the danger in international treaties, particularly when you have an activist and really rather politically radical Supreme Court at the moment. Uh, the danger is the Supreme Court will go with the president in allowing this treaty to be ratified effectively by the back door. They said they were going to do that during the election campaign, so it wouldn't surprise me if they try this on. Given Obama's czars and the power they seem to wield, do you think they'll have an effect on the checks and balances of Congress? Well, the danger is that all those checks and balances are, are now being effectively torn up. Uh, Congress is being increasingly bypassed in a well-trodden route. I mean, it's, it's been the same in, in various European legislatures for years, where left-wing regimes have always tended to have complete contempt for elected parliaments and congresses and to have governed instead round the back by putting in 
effectively little Hitlers, little dictators to run things. That's what these czars are. They're better off called as Hitlers because that's what they are. They just go in and do the will of their master and to hell with what the public thinks. And I think this is uh, increasingly a very serious problem in the Western democracies that the parliamentary institutions and congresses have not stood up to the increasing power of what's called the executive. That's the people who are elected actually to run the government day to day. They are now assuming more and more dictatorial powers. And Congresses and parliaments, the people we elect, are in fact proving powerless to stop them and often, frankly, lazy. I mean, in the United Kingdom, each new extension of the powers of the hideous European dictatorship has been allowed through with barely a murmur on the part of our elected representatives. Only a few gallant people have spoken out. And I think the same is, is going to prove to be the case in the United States. I have been doing my best to say to the Republican Party, for heaven's sake, all you have to do if they threaten to sign this treaty is to say this treaty will not bind, bind us unless it's ratified by the Senate, and we will simply repeal it. And if you make a loud enough noise about it, same with the waxman Markey and boxer Kerry climate bills, all the Republicans have to do is to use the five magic words which would strike terror into all these little Hitlers in Obama's administration, and those are the words, we will repeal this bill. They very seldom say this, but I have heard from Congressman John Linder, to whom I was speaking about this the other day, that they are now going to start saying that. They're going to say, we will repeal this extremist, left-wing legislation designed to address a climate problem which has never existed, doesn't exist, and never will exist. The human effect on the climate is now known by direct measurement to be minuscule. And so all of those fancy computer models, however much they may have agreed with one another, do not agree with observed reality. They are wrong. The science is in. The truth is out. The scare is over. There is no need for a Copenhagen or any other treaty to do with the climate, which is looking after itself just fine, as it always has. There's international pressure to get something done in Copenhagen, but there's now some feeling that it was too much too fast. What do you think about that? I think they have bitten off more than they can chew. I think they had hoped that by burying the draft of the treaty in a, an annex to a note by the Secretariat, which in turn was buried as a complicated uh, area of the UN's website, they hoped that nobody would find it. Fortunately, a colleague of mine did find it, sent it to me and said, look how shocking this is. I immediately began circulating it. I made a speech, in fact, in Minnesota about it just a month ago. And that speech has now already received more than three and a half million hits on YouTube. It's a record for any political speech. So concerned, in particular, are the citizens of the United States at the freedom-destroying, democracy-destroying, prosperity-destroying implications of this wicked treaty, which, which the world bureaucratic class had hoped to impose upon us by stealth after lying to us systematically for 25 years about the supposed threat of CO2 to the climate. CO2 is now known to be a harmless trace gas necessary to all plant and animal life on Earth. You breathe it out every time you speak, and there is no need to take any action whatever to restrict, to restrict our emissions of CO2. So I think they were trying to go too fast because they thought they'd got everybody where they wanted them. The left-wing poorer countries were going to vote for it because they were going to make money out of it. The EU was going to vote for it because the dictatorship says we must. We no longer have any say as an individual nation in what line the EU takes on this. America was going to sign it because Obama sees this as part of a, of a progress away from democracy and towards international dictatorial government of the kind which the communist left has always advocated. And so most major nations we're going to end up signing this thing. But there has been such a reaction from ordinary people saying, A, we don't need this, and B, even if we did need it, to abandon our democracy for the sake of this alleged climate problem is the wrong way to go about it. So many are saying that, that I think they're beginning to take fright, these horrible little dictators worldwide who are trying to effectively conspire against the governed. It's a conspiracy of the governing class, if you like, worldwide, against the governed. And the little guy is now standing up and saying, this far and no further. And I think that's a very, very good thing that at last the grassroots are standing up and being counted. Lord Monckton, would you please stay there and we'll come straight back to you after the break? Yes, I'll be delighted. And while I'm on, 
My website is www.scienceandpublicpolicy.org. You can read more about climate change there. I'll be right back. We're back in the Savage Nation with Lord Christopher Monckton, a real climate expert, and we're discussing the fraud of global warming with a true expert, not a fraudster like Al Gore. How do you think the treaty might end up in its final form? The Australians have said that they're going to boil the whole thing down to 15 pages from the nearly 200 pages it is at the moment. But unfortunately, at the moment, we have an unholy alliance in almost all major countries of extreme left-wing governments. I'm afraid the same even in the States is now the case, uh, who will sign anything if it does the West down. And unfortunately, what I fear will happen, unless more and more of the American people get in touch with their elected representatives and say this 